Then I would like to uh, move to introducing our second uh, keynote speaker for this conference. Professor Yulia Ustinova is Professor of Ancient History at the Department of General History of Ben-Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. She was born in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, in Russia, and she received her PhD there in 1988. In 1990, shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union, she emigrated to Israel. She is a classicist specialized in ancient Greek religion and combines historical and archaeological research with approaches from cognitive neuroscience, anthropology, and sociology. I'm extremely happy, I have to say, that Professor Ustinova was able to accept our invitation for a keynote speech at our conference because I believe that in her work we have an exemplary example of how historical and textual scholarship can be fruitfully combined with neuroscience and cognitive study of religion and how alterations of consciousness are key to understanding ancient Greek religion. A few years ago, I discovered her first book, published by Oxford University Press in 2009, titled Caves and the Ancient Greek Mind, Descending Underground in the Search for Ultimate Truth. Here she showed that conditions of extreme sensory deprivation can help us explain how and why visionaries who retreat into caves for purposes of prayer or meditation may have impressive, life-changing religious experiences of voices and visions. This year she followed up with her second major book, a comprehensive and, as far as I can judge, definitive overview of all the relevant source material in ancient Greece for such major topics as prophecy, near-death experiences, Bacchic frenzy, battlefield mania, nympholepsy, poetic frenzy, and erotic madness. All of this under the title Divine Mania, Alterations of Consciousness in Ancient Greece. In short, as you can see, Yuri Ustanova is at the forefront of research on the interface between textual historical classical studies and cognitive neuroscience focused on alterations of consciousness. So, Yulia, I'm very much looking forward to your lecture and hereby invite you to take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Walter. Uh, good afternoon. I would like be to begin with uh, expressing my deepest gratitude for uh, your kind invitation and for the hospitality of all the organizers which we enjoy in Amsterdam. Thank you very much. Uh, now to uh, my subject. Uh, you see here a picture of a small gem. These are two portraits. Uh, nowadays it is clear that these are Dionysus and a Salem, but once they were, uh, they, these people were identified as Socrates and Plato. So it is emblematic of something very important in the Greek culture. If the two greatest philosophers, at least of ancient Greece, and some people would say of the Western civilization, could be identified with two most ecstatic figures, at least of the classical world. The god of ecstasy and wine, Dionysus, and a, a, a figure from his uh, mythological uh, environment. Uh, and we will talk about uh, the conditions, the historical conditions, which made this association possible. Uh, in this presentation, we'll start with an introduction uh, and say a few words about mental experiences of, exp uh, of uh, exceptional inten intensity and alteration of consciousness, uh, followed by a few uh, methodological remarks. Then I'll talk about divine wisdom, which is the main subject of my uh, presentation, and alteration of consciousness in ancient Greece. Uh, give a few examples of alteration of consciousness, uh, mainly uh, focusing on uh, prophetic uh, techniques, uh, as you see, and then we'll uh, hopefully arrive at the conclusions. Mental experiences of exceptional intensity were ascribed in ancient Greece to divine intervention. Uh, a Byzantine uh, dictionary by Suda uh, explained what inspiration, epipnoia in Greece, uh, uh, in Greek was. 
in all the quotations in italics will the trans English translation of the text appear or a quotation in English from a modern scholar and therefore the uh, terms, the transliterations of the Greek terms will appear in regular script. So Suda tells us that inspiration, epipnea, is enthusiasmos. You all recognize the word. It's enthusiasm that is deriving from this word. In Greek, enthusiasmos is possession or seizure by a deity and uh, a word invented and therefore not sounding too nice to, uh, uh, through the ears of a, nation, of a native English speaker uh, is engodedness. But I am very fond of this word because it is really very impressive and it expresses the main idea of what enthusiasmos, heaven, the god, theos, in side is in Greek. So inspiration is in godliness. You see here an inspired performer of epic songs uh, with his head tossed back, his eyes looking in the heaven. And this uh, iconographic scheme was standard for portraying people uh, in this state of possession by a god. Just compare this performer with a minad, another figure from um, the train of uh, Dionysus. She has also her head tossed back. She is also looking into the heaven. But instead of a kithara, she holds a bakhik rod, which is just a stick decorated with ivy. So here we see that there was this convention in Greek art. And what is even more important is that this uh, the modern research on the behavior of people in altered state of consciousness includes this particular uh, posture of the head. And now we get to the modern expression, uh, alteration of consciousness and modern research. And this invites a question, how legitimate is the use of the modern material for in the study of ancient society or ancient art? We've got to, the, to, to use the term altered state of consciousness. Uh, so it has to be defi de uh, uh, defined. And the definition, I suggest, is one of the oldest, uh, but it is still in this world where so much is contested, more or less accepted by most people doing, um, doing, this, uh, the, doing research on alteration of consciousness. So any mental state induced by various physiological, psychological, or pharmacological maneuvers or agents, which can be recognized subjectively by the individual himself, or by the objective observer of the individual as representing a sufficient deviation in subjective experience or psychological functioning from certain general norms for that individual during alert, waking consciousness. What is important? First of all, the spectrum, the spectrum, the possibility of different kinds of alterations of consciousness and the fact that they can be induced by different methods. They can be um, experienced only by the individual, him or herself, or by an observer. So we are talking about quite a number uh, of multiple experiences. And it is still something that, at least in my very conservative field of classical studies, many people do not are not ready to, 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 to accept. And for them, whatever alteration of consciousness is necessarily frenzy, madness, something that is expressed in, in mad behavior. It can be like that, but not necessarily. One of the, oops, sorry, one of the uh, types of alteration of consciousness, a uh, subtype in fact, is uh, dubbed mystical state. What mystical state is? Uh, 
uh, or mystical experience. It is a state of mind achieved uh, commonly through some sort of self-cultivation, that is, there is something that a person does on purpose, on which the following are usually or often the silent, but not necessarily the only features. Uh, and let's look at what I emphasize in red. Uh, these are the most important uh, characteristics of uh, mystical experiences, at least for the today discussion. So, uh, a strong confidence in the reality of objectivity of the experience is very important. And this strong confidence uh, is so deeply embedded that it becomes uh, that it is transmitted by the experiencer to, uh, to, their, to, to their audience and therefore it is very persuasive. So the confidence in the reality or objectivity of the experience that is somehow re uh, uh, revelatory of the truth whatever truth, divine truth, ultimate truth, philosophical truth, but the important thing is that it is a truth and it is different from the, our usual everyday kind of truth. And quite paradoxically, this truth is often ineffable. It is not verbal and therefore it is very difficult to convey. In some cultures with developed mystical tra tradition, a, a dictionary of metaphorical expressions of this, of this revelations develops. But anyway, people feel terrible difficulty to convey this divine truth. We are talking about different traditions. We are talking about modern psychology. So how far can this material be used? And it is a big question. I suggest as one of the uh, most succinct expressions of what I can accept, uh, the words of Edward Sling uh, Slingerland in his What Science Offers the Humanities. Against postmodern uh, uh, relativism, we can maintain that there are structures of cognition common to all human beings. We are human and we have some uh, common structures of thinking, regardless of their culture, language, and particular history. This idea may seem something almost self-evident to a psychologist, but it is something that in humanities uh, is um, quite difficult to uh, insist on, because many historians would say that whatever culture has about is entirely cultural and therefore there is no such thing as universal structures of universal mental structures. Against objectivism saying that everything is universal we can argue that these commonalities are not reflections of some a priori order uh, existing independently of humans but rather out of interactions of biological systems with a fairly stable uh, physical world or with the cause of both evolutionary and personal time, which makes the presence of certain cognitive structures inevitable for creatures like ourselves. So what we're talking about is an interplay, an interaction between uh, universal structures that are characteristic of us being human and uh, the uh, indiv evolutionary and personal uh, influence, uh, so, sorry, and personal and cultural influences which are individual and which are dependent on their culture. This means something very important for the today talk. It, this means first the possibility to use comparative historical and anthropological materials in the study of past societies with all the due caution of course and the possibility of application of the results of neuropsychological and cognitive research of the modern mind to the study of the mind of ancient humans. How can this be done? Because the, our evidence is usually very scarce. 
we don't have uh, much, uh, we don't have any experiment, uh, experimental data. We cannot experiment with the ancient, with the ancient mind. Uh, and sometimes what we do possess are only hints. So what can be done with it? Uh, it seems to me that Cablin method uh, is a solution. It permits compensation for gaps in evidence by seeking an explanation in a different field and employing congruous data in explanatory models. Please look at this chain. If we lack just a little bit of one unit, we cannot proceed, it's broken. But if you look at the cable, the strands bro brought into the, say, uh, argumentation from a different field allow a connection of disconnected parts of the uh, of the cable. Therefore, if we ha if we have a few hints, say those iconographical hints which you have already seen, and we know from the modern material what this particular posture is about, and we also know that say the minard is involved in an ecstatic rite, we can say that it is not an iconographical convention and it is not something the artist invented, but we are talking about something real. Now, this is a polite and elegant way to do away with, say, my own ignorance. Because if we are talking about controversies within neuroscience, then it is legitimate for a person coming from humanities to say that, well, we cannot know. There are, contro uh, uh, of course, uh, disc arguments and many things are controversial in uh, cognitive sciences and neurosciences. But there is another problem, and let's face it, many of us, and your humble servant among them, are not able to assess correctly real scientific research in psychology. So we try to understand it as well as we can. We read a lot, we ask questions, <laughs> but, uh, but it is still problematic to understand the chemical or physiological mechanism of alteration of consciousness and the, 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 the exact way various chemical substances work. So, from this point of view, what saves the situation is the possibility to adopt phenomenological approach. So, disclosing how objectively, uh, so, sorry, how objectivity is elaborated out of finite and transient episodes of phenomenological consciousness is considered by phenomenology as more relevant than asking reciprocally how phenom phenomenal consciousness arises from certain objective processes. So, what we are trying to, to look at is the result of those physiological processes and this is what is most important at least for the students of humanities. With this in mind, we can now turn to the uh, subject of this presentation, divine wisdom and alteration of consciousness in ancient Greece. First of all, the Greeks were uh, 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 we're sure that the mind of the immortals is all concealed from man, as one of the wise men of, Greek, of Greece, Solon, said in the 6th century. So, divine wisdom is theoretically unattainable, but the Greeks learned to surpass this difficulty. And in the biography of Solon, we read that Epimenides, one of the archaic sages of Solon's age, acquired the knowledge of the divine by means of ecstatic, enthusiastic, and telestic wisdom. Telestic wisdom has to do with initiations, and I'll get there in a moment. So now we are told that by means of the divine inspiration, a human can get to, uh, to uh, uh, 
a certain understanding of the divine wisdom. How did, for instance, Epimenides uh, arrive at his um, revelations? Just look at this cave, uh, the Dictan cave on Crete, where his Epimenides is said to have slept from 40 to 60 years. There are different traditions. And there, while sleeping, he talked to the gods, including Zeus, listened to their conversations among themselves, and met truth and justice. So that's the way. We are looking at the cave, we understand, you see how deep it is. If you're there for quite a long time, uh, possibility of, uh, sen of sensory deprivation is there. And with sensory deprivation come visions, uh, um, very powerful discharge of inner, uh, of inner uh, rep representations, which consist, uh, which, uh, uh, an alteration of consciousness, which mean that whatever powerful discharge of inner uh, presentations is perceived by a person as, you remember, divine truth, and therefore what Epimenides had, I don't know, dreamt about, hallucinated while in the, in the cave would be uh, would be interpreted by him and by his uh, contemporaries as divine truth. Here we are at, a, at one way to attain um, this touch with the divine. And it is only one way. Plato talked in detail about the different ways to divine uh, in which mania, that is, alteration of consciousness, not necessarily madness, uh, allows one a contact with the divine. So what does Plato say? There are two kinds of mania, one uh, arising from human, for, from human diseases and the other from a divine re, uh, le, release from uh, customary habits. He says that the greatest blessings come to us through mania, and he explains that there are several kinds of divine mania and people ascribe them to four gods, much more, but for the purposes of, of the discussion and of Plato's scheme, four are enough. Uh, the telestic, uh, sorry, prophecy inspired by Apollo. And, and please look at this gem. You see Cassandra, this pro famous prophetess who was endowed with Apollo with the ability to prophesy. Apollo's crown is above, above her head. Later on, he denied him uh, her, um, uh, he denied him sexual contact, and therefore nobody, uh, n nobody believed her. But the point is that all of her prophecies were truthful, and they were inspired by Apollo. And the the connection between the mortal and the more and the immortal agents are really visible here. So Apollo is a prophetic god par excellence. Telestic mania belongs to Dionysus, you remember him. Uh, the uh, poetic mania is inspired by the muses and uh, the mania of love, Eros, uh, belongs to Aphrodite and Eros, and it is the best. And to this best kind of mania, uh, of mania inspired by Eros, we will return at the end. In the meantime, uh, we have to say a few words about telestic or initiatory wisdom. Once again, please look at li and this plaque. There are two, uh, which um, was dedicated in Eleusis, a place near Athens where the most important uh, mystery rites uh, of, the, of, of the Athenians uh, and other Greeks took part in them if they were in Athens were celebrated. The idea is that the most important, the core uh, uh, ceremony of, the, uh, of these rites was um, concealed, was secret, but many other parts were public. And 
It is the most important part that gave the feeling of immediate contact with the divine. And this is expressed here. Just look at them. These are the two goddesses, uh, Demeter and Korah, and the initiates approach them with torches in their hands. So the idea of light and of vision is very important. One sees the god and that's the way to be infused with their mania. Now, these are, this is the telestic wisdom. This is what we have already heard about, apropos Epimenides. But Plutarch in Morale talks, in fact, about philosophy. And now we see the connection between this great achievement of the Western civilization, Greek philosophy, and something having to do with these secret rites. So let's read this passage. Uh, the knowledge of what is knowable, pure and simple, that illuminates the soul like a thunderbolt, light we are talking about, and for this only time allows it to touch and see. The soul touches and sees the divine. For which reason Plato and Aristotle termed this part of philosophy apoptic, and here it is a term from the terminology of the mystery rites, which is, by the way, used by Plato himself in the symposium and elsewhere when he, uh, when he is talking about, the, about great revelations. So, apoptic, because they pass by ostensible, heterogeneous, and manifold notions, and leap up towards the primal, the simple, and the immaterial. And when they really touch the pure truth concerning these matters, they think that just as in mystery initiations, and the word is telepe, they reach the end, tell us, of philosophy. So, on the one hand, philosophy is initiation. And doing it correctly is, requires an initiation. But on the other hand, we are told what initiation is. It is also touching upon divine, uh, the divine and seeing it. So inspiration comes from God. What is, the, uh, what is the role of the human agent here? Aristotle is quite clear. On this account also, in the case of persons who are inspired, who are in the state of enthusiasmos, they are engodded. And utter prophecies, although they perform an act of thought, nevertheless we do not say that saying what they said and doing what they did rested with themselves. So it is the God who uses them as an instrument. And it is most clearly said by, once again, Plutarch, when he talks about the Pythia, the prophetic, you see her, the prophetic priestess of Apollo in the most important center of prophecy in the Greek world in Delphi, where she's perched on a tripod and uh, has some water in, uh, in a bowl and there is the inquirer in front of her. So, what, does hap what happens to Pythia while she prophesies? Plutarch explains, and by the way, he knows what he's talking about because he was a priest in Delphi. The voice of the Pythia is not that of the God, not the utterance of it, not the diction, not the matter, not all these, uh, but all these are the woman's. He puts into her, into her mind only the visions, fantasie, and creates the light in her soul. Once again, we are talking about light. In regard to the future, for inspiration and godliness, enthusiasmos is precisely this. Thus, the instrument has to be worthy, but on the other hand, the main contents of the prophecy rests with the God. And this is important because otherwise, how can divine wisdom come to the humans via a human? And it is clear from the cognitive point of view that it can, that here we are talking about a way the ancient people perceived what now anthropologists using cognitive approaches tell us. For it is at any moment, there is only one intentional agency represented, one mind and not the two. So when the gods 
speaks through the Pythia, it is the god. Although she is something like a mouthpiece of the god. Uh, I will not talk much about Delphi uh, because it is too complicated and too controversial and I want to, uh, to, to, to proceed to the philosophers. But on the other hand, I feel that it should be an example of inspired prophecy given, has to be given. Uh, and I chose the oracular sanctuary of Apollo at Claros in Asia Minor in Turkey, which flourished and was extremely popular, one of the four most popular oracular sanctuaries of the Greek world, in addition to Delphi. Um, so it was the uh, sanctuary of Apollo at Claros. Uh, the uh, first evidence, the uh, earliest, is uh, from the seventh, sixth century BC. But the name of the uh, of this place was associated with prophecy giving even earlier. The temple which you see in front of you was built in the fourth century. The previous one, the archaic one, was destroyed, and the. The point is that the prophecy, that the personnel of this uh, sanctuary included a Tespiodes, which in translation from Greek is an inspired singer. You see the, the, the idea of, of inspiration is here. And a prophetess, a prophet who uh, put down uh, the, um, the, the prophecy. The, the Thespiodes was appointed for life. The prophetess, technical staff, uh, he uh, was um, elected uh, annually. So Pliny says in, uh, about the way the uh, prophecy is given in Claros at Colophon, in the cave, speckles of the Clarion Apollo, once again we're talking about a cave, but this kind, it is not a natural cave, but an artificial grotto, which you see in front of you. There is a pool, water, you remember water, an agent which transmits prophecy, uh, by drinking of which a power is acquired or uttering wonderful oracles, but the lives of those who attain, uh, who drink uh, uh, of it are shortened. Now, this water is just regular water, H2O. There is nothing prophetic in it. Uh, it has been checked, but it is the strain. It is the psychological strain of prophecy giving, which, as the ancient already knew, was so um, it was so stressful that the Thespiode did not live for long. And what happened there is that the uh, prophetic person alone uh, descended into the grotto with the prophet who remained here. And the water is even deeper there. And only those uh, inquirers who had uh, undergone special initiation rites could join the, uh, the place. So uh, once again, we are talking uh, about a person who was inspired by the gods and who, as Yamblikos tells, was, neither, uh, was um, uh, not in control of himself. So we are returning to the idea of divine uh, con of, of the use of the uh, pro of the um, medium as an instrument uh, of uh, in the uh, of the uh, gods. The divine in Claros had to abstain from food for a day and night before descending through a maze-like corridor. You see this maze-like corridor, right? Uh, into the underground chamber where he drank from the sacred water. Now, so we see that it is not only being almost alone in an underground chamber, but it is also a long fast and, uh, and um, isolation from human affairs, as you see. And it was just a regular person without any special uh, education. Once again, I return to the, uh, to, to the problem of prophecy drinking. In modern term, the medium at Claros, an individual endowed with a proclivity for alteration of consciousness, attained this state due to the effect of descent into the underground grotto. 
and we are not uh, 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 talking about something that is easy. Uh, pro uh, inspired prophecy uh, consumed much energy and resources, and what it was difficult to control in contrast to uh, reading the signs. However, it was considered uh, to be less dependent on human mind and to come directly from the gods. Therefore, uh, ultimate source of truth and authority. In addition, we have mentioned uh, mystery cults, and all this flourished in Greece, and it is very interesting, something ab abnormal, because in most uh, complex society, uh, ancient and modern, people involved in ecstatic rites are regular, uh, uh, regularly belong to underprivileged groups and uh, marginalized, and it was not the situation in Greece. The reason is Greek lack of dogma and, uh, and uh, religious authority. And uh, this sit in this situation, no immunal mechanisms uh, oppressing the alteration of consciousness uh, or minimizing its impact on the society developed in, developed in ancient Greece. And therefore, there was this climate that allowed the use of these techniques and the respect for the um, what seems unrational way to truth by uh, Greek thinkers uh, and philosophers. So we are talking about much more than tolerance. We are talking about embeddedness of uh, the um, acceptance of uh, alterations of consciousness in the Greek culture. Now let's talk about the sages and philosophers. There is no authentic um, uh, portrait of Pythagoras. Therefore, I suggest that you look at this musician because his, um, his contribution was not only in the sphere of philosophy, but also uh, uh, geometry and musical theory. And in addition, this uh, um, great thinker perhaps did not write at least we have no writings uh, belonging to him. Uh, his disciples uh, underwent complex initiations, including many years of silence. And therefore, the circle of disciples of uh, Pythagoras is often regarded as a sect. There is a considerable traditional and religious element there. What a surprise! that uh, Pythagoras acquired his wisdom in underground places where he descended uh, on several occasions. First in Samos, where he began his career, he has a had a grotto where he concentrated on his philosophy. Then at Croton in Italy, where he immigrated, he descended into a, a cave and uh, and remain there for some time. You see this picture uh, here, um, visual, visualizing this descent. Then on Crete and perhaps uh, even in Egypt, although these parts of his biography are um, perhaps not trustworthy, but it's important that the tradition uh, existed. He also fasted or ate special uh, food uh, which uh, not only um, uh, not only inspired uh, visions, but also created the um, separation of Pythagoras and his disciples from the rest of the population. And look, he is told by his almost uh, uh, contemporary Empedocles. No, not his thought. We are told about him that he was a man of outstanding knowledge who possessed the greatest wealth of Prapides, in a, in a minute I'll say what it is, and became especially ca uh, capable of all wise deeds. For whenever he stretched his Prapides, easily he contemplated each of the things existing in the 10th and 20th generations of men. Prapides is sometimes incorrectly interpreted as mind. It is not mind. It is something in one's chest. In Homer, on several occasions, people are wounded in their propides. So it is something in the chest. And what we are, to uh, what we are told about is something like breathing exercises. And it is while uh, 
employing this yoga-like technique that Pythagoras was able to attain these special visions of whatever happened. Inspirations and methods of its attainment uh, uh, in later philosophy. And I'll talk only about Socrates and Plato. Uh, Socrates, uh, the, uh, the, there are several, mm, say, kinds of alterations of consciousness ascribed to him. Uh, out of body experiences, uh, sudden uh, illuminations and prolonged trance-like meditations. But the important thing is that on the threshold of his death, which is described by Plato in Phaedo, where Plato could not be ironic, he was talking about his beloved master going to die very soon. Plato makes Socrates, who uh, also didn't write, so whatever we know about him comes from Plato and, uh, 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 and Xenophon, uh, his disciples. So uh, Socrates said, for as they say uh, concerning Mr. Wrights, many bear the back road, but few are back hands. And the later are, in my opinion, those who have practiced pr philosophy are right. And in my life I have left nothing undone, but made every effort to become one of them. One of those, you see here, a minor. This is what Socrates wished. <laughs> but he says that. And he says that true philosoph philosophy is Bakhek. And what he wants to say is that Bakhreya and Mania, this alteration of consciousness, is not necessarily frantic in our understanding. That we are talking about <coughs> divinely inspired way of attaining the truth. And this is what Socrates was trying to do all his life. We know uh, he, uh, well, we don't know, we have hints at his out-of-body experiences, which were called Horis, uh, which was called Horismos. And we know, this time we know, that Greeks were acquainted with this kind of experience. And they visualized it as soul leaving the body. What you have here is an, a, a representation uh, of, it is not a dragonfly, it's a soul leaving the body of the dead person. You see? Here. Right? And, uh, a, and the soul could leave the body either uh, before the death or uh, when a person uh, faints or in certain special states. And this is what, so uh, once again, uh, Plato has Socrates say. And does not the purification consist in this, which has been mentioned long ago in our discourse, in separating, you see the word, to horizon, as far as possible, the soul from the body and teaching the soul the habit of collecting and bringing itself together from all the parts of the body and living so far as it can, both now and hereafter, alone by itself, freed from the body as from fetters. This kind of description can be given only by a person who has experienced it uh, himself and there are other examples. So it is quite probable, once again, if we are using Cablian methods, or if we compare this text to other texts, modern and ancient, to talk about his out-of-body experiences. He felt uh, minutes of illumination, and uh, this is what happened when his spirit, Daimonian, gave him a sign, not necessarily verbal, and he is prolonged trance-like uh, uh, meditations uh, gave uh, a loud talking about the, his practice of mental withdrawal and concentration. We don't know what on this particular occasion, which you see uh, the, uh, uh, mentioned in the quotation, in front of you, on the battlefield near Potidaea, where all the soldiers were getting ready for the uh, for, for, for their military duties, he was just frozen for a day for, for, for a day and a night, thinking.
token of something. So these are the ways which were deeply revered by Plato uh, and which he ascribed to his master Socrates. What I can also say, and, and, and now I'm uh, approaching the end, uh, that Plato also had ecstatic revelations himself. In the letters, number seven, which is considered by most scholars authentic, although there is a discussion of its authenticity, uh, Plato says, there does not exist, nor will ever exist, any treatise of mine dealing with this subject, for it does not at all admit of verbal expression, like other studies, but as a result of long association with the subject itself and communion therewith, it is brought to birth in the soul of a sudden, as light that was kindled by a leaping spark, and thereafter it nourishes itself. So we are talk, uh, taught about different kind of doctrines, those that can be put into writing, and those, and those that don't allow verbal expression, which are ineffable, and which appear after long communion with them. And it is even a term hinting at a sexual communion. And it is something sudden, and once again we are talking about light. Now, this is the seventh letter, and there are people who would say that it is not authentic. But in his most authentic writings, Plato talk hints at the, uh, at, at, at the same main points. For instance, in the laws, he talks about, first, the necessity to acquire some knowledge of the, uh, of the truth before it, is, um, uh, before it is offered to the uh, to, to disciples. And it is not really undescribable, but it cannot be described prescribed to people who have not lived through this uh, 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 process of communion and, uh, and association with, with the problem. And Aristotle, Plato's disciple, says that an account Plato gives in, a, in Timaeus, in a dialogue of him, uh, differs from what he says in his so-called unwritten teachings. So Plato had unwritten teachings. And in these unwritten teachings, he spoke with people who could understand him, who, could, uh, who through prolonged communion had an, uh, arrived at an understanding of the problems about these revelatory moments, which it is pointless to talk about with people who don't know what revelation is. And it is not only Plato who thinks like that. I could give you multiple examples of modern thinkers who do, even not philosophy, but say mathematics as Carl Gustav Gauss, and who arrived at their mathematical or chemical or whatever ideas, um, musical and so on, as a, a sudden flash of lightning, as something given by a god, this feeling of, 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 of God-given uh, truth is especially important. Now, the last example from Plato and then the conclusions. In his Republic, once again, nobody dis, uh, uh, can, can uh, uh, argue that it is not authentic. He's talking about something that cannot be uh, in all honesty perceived otherwise than a mystical experience. Shall we not then be defending him fairly if we say that as a true lover of learning, he has born to fight his way through reality and not fritter away from his time among those many individual subjects that are reckoned to be real. He moves on without losing heart on seizing from his passion until he gets hold of the nature which and everything through that part of the soul which is fitted to get hold of something of that sort through its kingship with it. So we are talking about com communion. But furthermore, through this, after he has approached and had intercourse, and this is the word in Greek which is used for sexual intercourse, uh, to intelligence and truth, has intercourse with what really exists, 
something divine, and given birth, what can we wish more? To intelligence and truth, he may gain knowledge and a true life, and be nourished and so be relieved of his labor, pangs, and not before. So nourishment was also mentioned in the seventh letter, and here we are getting to the erotic mania, which is the best? You remember the quotation from which we had begun. N because when it is not carnal, but intellectual, this erotic mania allows the touch on the divine truth. Now the inter interferences. First concerning Greek intellectuals, and I'll read them because we have no time. Greek poets, prophets, and philosophers of the archaic and classical ages attributed their knowledge and inspiration to intervention of, supernatural, of a supernatural agent. Prominent intellectuals made effort to manipulate their consciousness with the aim of attaining states of mind favorable for getting inspiration, and employed traditional age-old practices for this purpose. Plato's writings allow a glimpse into his own and Plato's alterations of consciousness, which comprised out-of-body experiences and revelator visions. These illuminations could be verbalized only imperfectly. They could be fully understood only by the initiated, those who practiced the same discipline and attained the same state of bakheya and mania. In a modified form, mystical experiences inspired the doctrines that were put forward in public, orally, or in writing. Rationality and the final coherent form of a thinker's tenets do not imply that their origin was purely in logical deliberation. And now the conclusions of my, uh, of my talk. When the Greeks witnessed a state of mind that was beyond comprehension in terms of regular experiences, they thought of engodedness, enthusiasmos, and engodedness is the word invented by Herbert Hoffman. Such phenomena were ascribed either to pure divine intervention or to interaction of human and divine forces. In Greece, different kinds of consciousness alteration were viewed as a mainstream and actively endorsed by the communities. In order to attain divine wisdom, intellectuals used methods comparable with the techniques applied in vision quest by traditional sages and in oracular practices. And finally, what is most imp more important to many of you than Greek uh, practices is that some characteristics of these practices are universal. Rational thinkers and spiritual seekers in the past in ancient Greece and nowadays report some concrete experiences that they regard as salient. And these experiences are ascribed to a god. And even God has to be divinely inspired because you see here Apollo, the god, the divine patron of uh, poetry and prophecy with his lair, lyre born uh, away on the wings of a wing tripod, the, like the tripod on which Pythia had to be perched. So it is so natural for the Greeks that a god must inspire, that even the god's inspiration is, in some solipsistic way, inspired by himself. Thank you very much.